Section zero of A General View of Positivism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A General View of Positivism by Auguste Comte. Translated by John Henry Bridges. Introduction and Introductory Remarks. Republic of the West order and progress a general view of positivism or summary exposition of the system of thought and life adapted to the great western republic formed of the five advanced nations the french italian spanish british and german which since the time of charlemagne have always constituted a political whole reorganiser sans dieu ni roi par le culte systématique de l'humanité. Nul ne doit qu'à faire son devoir. L'esprit doit toujours être le ministre du cours et jamais son esclave. Reorganization, irrespectively of God or King, by the worship of humanity, systematically adopted. Man's only right is to do his duty. The intellect should always be the servant of the heart and should never be its slave by Auguste Comte, author of System of Positive Philosophy, Paris, 1848. Introduction by Frederick Harrison Although positivism has been pretty widely discussed of late, not only by those interested in philosophy and religion, but by the general reader and the public press, perhaps but few of them, whether readers or critics, have exactly grasped the full meaning of it as a system at once of thought and of life. The vast range of ground it covers in the technical, elusive, and close style of Comte's writings in the original have made it difficult to master the subject as a whole. It has accordingly been thought that the time has come to add to the new universal library a translation of the general view of positivism, i.e. the careful summary of the positive polity which Auguste Comte prefixed to the four volumes of his principal work. The translation, which was published by Dr. J. H. Bridges in 1865, is at the same time a most accurate version by one of Comte's earliest followers, and also it is turned in an easy and simpler style, with the references and allusions explained, marginal headings to the paragraphs, and a complete analysis of the contents. Positivism is not simply a system of philosophy, nor is it simply a new form of religion, nor is it simply a scheme of social regeneration. It partakes of all of these, and professes to harmonize them under one dominant conception that is equally philosophic and social. Its primary object, writes Comte, is twofold, to generalize our scientific conceptions and to systematize the art of social life. Accordingly, Comte's ideal embraces the three main elements of which human life consists, thoughts, feelings, and actions. Now it is clear that no such comprehensive system was ever before offered to the world. Neither the gospel nor any known type of religion undertook to give a synthetic grouping of the sciences. No synthetic scheme of philosophy ever attempted to correlate religion, politics, art, and industry. No system of socialism, ancient or modern, started with mathematics and led up to an ideal of human devotion to duty, with a ritual of worship, both public and private. Now Comte's famous positive polity did attempt this gigantic task, and the novelty and extent of such a work explains and accounts for the extreme difficulty met with by readers of the original French, and also for the fascination which it has maintained more than fifty years after the author's death. It has been talked about, criticized, even ridiculed, with an ignorance of its true character which can only be excused by the abstract and severe form in which Comte thought right to condense his thoughts. Comte was primarily a mathematician, and neither Descartes nor Newton troubled themselves about the general reader. Kepler, they said, declared himself satisfied if he had one convert in a century, and philosophers have seldom had justice done them until some generations have passed. The difficulties presented by the scientific form of Comte's works have been obviated for English readers by the versions of his English followers, which are at once literal translations, analyses, and elucidations. 
For the general reader, nothing could be more serviceable than Bridge's clear presentation of Comte's own general view, or summary of his system. The translation itself is a literary masterpiece. It renders an extremely abstract and complex French type of philosophical dogmatism into easy and simple English, whilst at the same time preserving and even elucidating the somewhat cryptic allusions and nuances of the original. The thought in the French is full, pregnant, and suggestive, at once subtle and abstract, and rich with words of a new coinage, such as altruism, sociology, dynamics, i.e. history, and old words used in a special sense. This difficulty Dr. Bridges surmounts by breaking up the involved sentences, supplying names and facts indirectly referred to, and by transferring technical language into popular English. The success of the translation has been proved by the thousands of copies sold in the original duodecimo edition of 1865, in the octavo edition of 1875, and in the stereotyped reprint of 1881. A pathetic interest attaches to the history of the translation. In 1860, Dr. Bridges, just settled as a physician in Melbourne, lost his young wife by fever. He at once returned to England, bringing the remains of his wife for internment in the family graveyard in Suffolk. In those days of sailing vessels, the voyage home round Cape Horn occupied at least three months. Dr. Bridges resolved to conquer his sorrow, shut himself in the cabin during the voyage home, and completed the translation in 430 pages of print within the time at sea. The sad mechanic exercise, like dull narcotics numbing pain. Auguste Comte always spoke of the positive polity as his principal work. The Discours sur l'ensemble, or general view of positivism, formed the introduction to the four volumes. It forms a summary of the entire work, and is indeed a systematic application of the doctrine to the actual condition of society. As the polity, taken as a whole, professes to embody a set of doctrines for the regulation of thought and life, the present introduction is designed to show the need of such a body of doctrine, the result that they would produce, and the mode in which they are likely to work. Thus, one who desires to see in one view the social purpose which positivism proposes to effect would find it in no single volume better than in this treatise. The work consists of six chapters, treating positivism respectively in its intellectual aspect, its social aspect, its influence on the working classes, on women, on art, and on religion. In other words, it illustrates the application of the system to philosophy, politics, industry, the family, poetry, and the future. It opens with a comparison of positivist doctrines with those of the leading extant philosophies. It closes with a picture of society should those doctrines be realized. It is thus both a criticism of current theories and a utopia of a possible future. Of the intermediate chapters, the first deals with the principal changes proposed in our actual political system. The next chapter deals with the changes proposed in our present social system. Then come the last two chapters, dealing with the principal agents, art, poetry, and religion, by which those changes may be promoted. This book is therefore a practical introduction to the subject as a whole, for it sets forth the aim of positivism as a system, and then how it seeks to affect that aim. A GENERAL VIEW OF POSITIVISM We tire of thinking, and even of acting. We never tire of loving. In the following series of systematic essays upon positivism, the essential principles of the doctrine are first considered. I then point out the agencies by which its propagation will be effected, and I conclude by describing certain additional features indispensable to its completeness. My treatment of these questions will, of course, be summary, yet it will suffice, I hope, to overcome several excusable but unfounded prejudices. It will enable any competent reader to assure himself that the new general doctrine aims at something more than satisfying the intellect, that it is in reality quite as favorable to feeling and even to imagination. Introductory Remarks Positivism consists essentially of a philosophy and a polity, these can never be dissevered, the former being the basis, and the latter the end of one comprehensive system, in which our intellectual faculties and our social sympathies are brought into close correlation with each other. 
for in the first place the science of society besides being more important than any other supplies only the logical and scientific link by which all our varied observations of phenomena can be brought into one consistent whole of this science it is even more true than of any of the preceding sciences that its real character cannot be understood without explaining its exact relation in all general features with the art corresponding to it now here we find a coincidence which is assuredly not fortuitous at the very time when the theory of society is being laid down an immense sphere is opened for the application of that theory the direction namely of the social regeneration of western europe for if we take another point of view and look at the great crisis of modern history as its character is displayed in the natural course of events it becomes every day more evident how hopeless is the task of reconstructing political institutions without the previous remodeling of opinion and of life to form then a satisfactory synthesis of all human conceptions is the most urgent of our social wants and it is needed equally for the sake of order and of progress during the gradual accomplishment of this great philosophical work a new moral power will arise spontaneously throughout the west which as its influence increases will lay down a definite basis for the reorganization of society it will offer a general system of education for the adoption of civilized nations and by this means will supply in every department of public and private life fixed principles of judgment and of conduct thus the intellectual movement and the social crisis will be brought continually into close connection with each other both will combine to prepare the advanced portion of humanity for the acceptance of a true spiritual power a power more coherent as well as more progressive than the noble but premature attempt of medieval catholicism the primary object then of positivism is twofold to generalize our scientific conceptions and to systematize the art of social life these are but two aspects of one and the same problem they will form the subjects of the first two chapters of this work i shall first explain the general spirit of the new philosophy I shall then show its necessary connection with the whole course of that vast revolution which is now about to terminate under its guidance in social reconstruction this will lead us naturally to another question the regenerating doctrine cannot do its work without adherence in what quarter shall we hope to find them now with individual exceptions of great value we cannot expect the adhesion of any of the upper classes in society they are all more or less under the influence of baseless metaphysical theories and of aristocratic self-seeking they are absorbed in blind political agitation and in disputes for the possession of the useless remnants of the old theological and military system their action only tends to prolong the revolutionary state indefinitely and can never result in true social renovation whether we regard its intellectual character or its social objects it is certain that positivism must look elsewhere for support it will find a welcome in those classes only whose good sense has been left unimpaired by our vicious system of education and whose generous sympathies are allowed to develop themselves freely it is among women therefore and among the working classes that the heartiest supporters of the new doctrine will be found it is intended indeed ultimately for all classes of society but it will never gain much real influence over the higher ranks till it is forced upon their notice by these powerful patrons when the work of spiritual reorganization is completed it is on them that its maintenance will principally depend and so too their combined aid is necessary for its commencement having but little influence in political government they are more likely to appreciate the need of a moral government the special object of which it will be to protect them against the oppressive action of the temporal power in the third chapter therefore i shall explain the mode in which philosophers and working men will cooperate both have been prepared for this coalition by the general course which modern history has taken and it offers now the only hope we have of really decisive action we shall find that the efforts of positivism to regulate and develop the natural tendencies of the people make it even from the intellectual point of view more coherent and complete but there is another and a more unexpected source from which positivism will obtain support and not till then will its true character and the full extent of its constructive power be appreciated 
i shall show in the fourth chapter how eminently calculated is the positive doctrine to raise and regulate the social condition of women it is from the feminine aspect only that human life whether individually or collectively considered can really be comprehended as a whole for the only basis on which a system really embracing all the requirements of life can be formed is the subordination of intellect to social feeling a subordination which we find directly represented in the womanly type of character whether regarded in its personal or social relations although these questions cannot be treated fully in the present work i hope to convince my readers that positivism is more in accordance with the spontaneous tendencies of the people and of women than catholicism and is therefore better qualified to institute a spiritual power it should be observed that the ground on which the support of both these classes is obtained is that positivism is the only system which can supersede the various subversive schemes that are growing every day more dangerous to all the relations of domestic and social life yet the tendency of the doctrine is to elevate the character of both of these classes and it gives the most energetic sanction to all their legitimate aspirations thus it is that a philosophy originating in speculations of the most abstract character is found applicable not merely to every department of practical life but also to the sphere of our moral nature but to complete the proof of its universality i have still to speak of yet another very essential feature i shall show in spite of prejudices which exist very naturally on this point that positivism is eminently calculated to call the imaginative faculties into exercise it is by these faculties that the unity of human nature is most distinctly represented they are themselves intellectual but their field lies principally in our moral nature and the result of their operation is to influence the active powers the subject of women treated in the fourth chapter will lead me by a natural transition to speak in the fifth of the aesthetic aspects of positivism i shall attempt to show that the new doctrine by the very fact of embracing the whole range of human relations in the spirit of reality discloses the true theory of art which has hitherto been so great a deficiency in our speculative conceptions the principle of the theory is that in coordinating the primary functions of humanity positivism places the idealities of the poet midway between the ideas of the philosopher and the realities of the statesman we see from this theory how it is that the poetical power of positivism cannot be manifested at present we must wait until moral and mental regeneration has advanced far enough to awaken the sympathies which naturally belong to it and on which art in its renewed state must depend for the future the first mental and social shock once passed poetry will at last take her proper rank she will lead humanity onward towards a future which is now no longer vague and visionary while at the same time she enables us to pay due honor to all phases of the past the great object which positivism sets before us individually and socially is the endeavor to become more perfect the highest importance is attached therefore to the imaginative faculties because in every sphere which with they deal they stimulate the sense of perfection limited as my explanations in this work must be i shall be able to show that positivism while opening out a new and wide field for art supplies in the same spontaneous way new means of expression i shall thus have sketched with some detail the true character of the regenerating doctrine all its principal aspects will have been considered beginning with its philosophical basis i pass by natural transitions to its political purpose thence to its action upon the people its influence with women and lastly to its aesthetic power in concluding this work which is but the introduction to a larger treatise i have only to speak of the conception which unites all these various aspects as summed up in the positivist motto love order progress they lead us to the conception of humanity which implicitly involves and gives new force to each of them rightly interpreting this conception we view positivism at last as a complete and consistent whole the subject will naturally lead us to speak in general terms of the future progress of social regeneration as far as the history of the past enables us to foresee it the movement originates in france and is limited at first to the great family of western nations i shall show that it will afterwards extend in accordance with definite laws to the rest of the white race and finally to the other two great races of man end of section zero
section number one of A General View of Positivism by Auguste Con. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A General View of Positivism by Auguste Con, translated by John Henry Bridger. Chapter one The Intellectual Character of Positivism, Part one. The object of philosophy is to present a systematic view of human life as a basis for modifying its imperfections. The object of all true philosophy is to frame a system which shall comprehend human life under every aspect, social as well as individual. It embraces, therefore, the three kinds of phenomena of which our life consists, thoughts, feelings and actions. Under all these aspects the growth of humanity is primarily spontaneous and the basis on which all wise attempts to modify it should proceed can only be furnished by an exact acquaintance with the natural process. We are, however, able to modify this process systematically and the importance of this extreme since we can thereby gradually diminish the partial deviations, the disastrous delays and the grave inconsistencies to which so complex a growth would be liable were it left entirely to itself. To effect this necessary intervention is the proper sphere of politics, but a right conception cannot be formed of it without the aid of the philosopher, whose business it is to define and amend the principles on which it is conducted. With this object in view, the philosopher endeavours to coordinate the various elements of man's existence, so that it may be conceived of theoretically as an integral whole. His synthesis can only be valid in far as it is an exact and complete representation of the relations naturally existing. The first condition is therefore that these relations be carefully studied. When the philosopher, instead of forming such a synthesis, attempts to interfere more directly with the course of practical life, he commits the error of usurping the province of the statesman, to whom all practical measures exclusively belong. Philosophy and politics are the two principal functions of the great social organism. Morality systematically considered forms the connecting link and at the same time the line of demarcation between them. It is the most important application of philosophy and it gives a general direction to polity. Natural morality, that is to say the various emotions of our moral nature, will, as I have shown in my previous work, always govern the speculations of the one and the operations of the other. This I shall explain more fully. But the synthesis which is the social function of philosophy to construct, will neither be real nor permanent unless it embraces every department of human nature, whether speculative, effective or practical. These three orders of phenomena react upon each other so intimately that any system which does not include all of them must inevitably be unreal and inadequate. Yet it is only in the present day, when philosophy is reaching the positive stage, that it is which a highest and most essential mission can be fully apprehended. The theological synthesis failed to include the practical side of human nature. The theological synthesis depended exclusively upon our affective nature, and this is owing to its original supremacy and ultimate decline. For a long time its influence over all our highest speculations was paramount. This was especially the case during the polytheistic period when imagination and feeling still held their sway under very slight restraint from the reasoning faculties. Yet even during the time of its highest development intellectually and socially, theology exercised no real control over practical life. It reacted, of course, upon to some extent, but the effects of it were in most cases far more apparent than real. There was a natural antagonism between them, which though at first hardly perceived, went on increasing till at last it brought about the entire destruction of theological fabric. A system so purely subjective could not harmonise with the necessarily objective tendencies and stubborn realities of practical life. Theology asserted all phenomena to be under the dominion of wills more or less arbitrary, whereas in practical life men were led more and more clearly to the conception of invariable laws. For without laws human action would have admitted of no rule or plan. In consequence of this utter inability of theology to deal with practical life, its treatment of speculative and even of moral problems was exceedingly imperfect, such problems being all or more or less dependent on the practical necessities of life. 
to present a perfectly synthetic view of human nature was then impossible as long as the influence of theology lasted because the intellect was impelled by feeling and by the active powers in two totally different directions the failure of all metaphysical attempts to form a synthesis need not be dwelt upon here metaphysicians in spite of their claims to absolute truth have never been able to supersede theology in questions of feeling and have proved still more inadequate in practical questions ontology even when it was the most triumphant in the schools was always limited to subjects of a purely intellectual nature and even here its abstractions useless in themselves dealt only with the case of individual development the metaphysical spirit being thoroughly limited ontology even when it was its most triumphant in the schools was always limited to subjects of a purely intellectual nature and even here its abstractions useless in themselves dealt only with the case of individual development the metaphysical spirit being thoroughly incompatible with the social point of view in my work on positive philosophy i have clearly proved that it constitutes only a transitory phase of mind and it is totally inadequate for any constructive purpose for a time it was supreme but its utility lay simply in revolutionary tendencies it aided the preliminary development of humanity by its gradual inroads upon theology which though in ancient times entrusted with the sole direction of society had long since become in every respect utterly retrograde but the positive spirit originated in practical life but all positive speculations owe their first origin to the occupations of practical life and consequently they have always given some indication of their capacity for regulating our active powers which had been admitted from every former synthesis their value in this respect has been and still is materially impaired by their want of breadth and their isolated and incoherent character but it has always been instinctively felt the importance that we attach to, uh, to theories which teach the laws of phenomena and give us the power of provision is chiefly due to the fact that they alone can regulate our otherwise blind action upon the external world hence it is that while the positive spirit has been growing more and more theoretical and has gradually extended to every department of speculation it has never lost the practical tendencies which it derived from its source and this even in the case of researches unless in themselves and only to be justified as logical exercises from its first origin in mathematics and astronomy it has always shown its tendency to systematize the whole of our conceptions in every new subject which has been brought within the scope of its fundamental principle it exercised for a long time a modifying influence on the theological and metaphysical principles which had gone on increasing and since the time of descartes and bacon it has become evident that it is destined to supersede them altogether positivism has gradually taken possession of the preliminary sciences of physics and biology and in these old systems no longer prevail all that remained was to complete this range of influence by including the social study of social phenomena for this study metaphysics has proved incompetent by theological thinkers it has only been pursued indirectly and empirically as a condition of government i believe that my work on positive philosophy has so far supplied what it was wanting i think it now must be clear to all that the positive spirit can embrace the entire range of thought without lessening or rather without the effect of strengthening its original tendency to regulate practical life and it is a further guarantee for the stability of the new intellectual synthesis that social science with its final result of researches gives them that systematic character in which they had hitherto been wanting by supplying the only connecting link of which they all admit this conception is already adopted by true thinkers all must now acknowledge that the positive spirit tends necessarily towards the formation of a comprehensive and durable system in which every practical as well as every speculative subject shall be included but such a system would still be far from realizing that universal character without which positivism would be incompetent to supersede theology in the spiritual government of humanity for the element which really preponderates in every human being that is to say affection would still be left untouched this element is and this only which gives a stimulus and direction to the other two parts of our nature without it the one would waste 
its force in ill-conceived or at least useless studies, and the other in barren or in dangerous contention. With this immense deficiency, the combination of our theoretical and active powers would be fruitless, because it would lack the only principle which could ensure its real and permanent stability. The failure would be even greater than the failure of theology in dealing with practical questions, for the unity of human nature cannot really be made to depend either on the rational or the active facilities. In the life of the individual, and still more in the life of the race, the basis of unity, as I shall show in the fourth chapter, must always be feeling. It is to the fact that theology arose spontaneously from feeling that its influence is for the most part due. And although theology is now palpably on the decline, yet it will retain, in principle at least, some legitimate claim to the direction of society, so long as the new philosophy fails to occupy this important vantage ground. We come then to the final conditions with which the modern synthesis must comply. Without neglecting the spheres of thought and action, it must also comprehend the moral sphere, and the very principle on which its claim to universality rests must be derived from feeling. Then, and not till then, can the claims of theology be finally set aside. For then the new system will have surpassed the old in that which is the one essential purpose of all general doctrines. It will have shown itself able to effect what no other doctrine has done, that is to bring the three primary elements of our nature into harmony. If positivism were to prove incapable of satisfying this condition, we must give up all hope of systematization of any kind. For while positive principles are now sufficiently developed to neutralize those of theology, yet on the other hand the influence of theology would continue to be far greater. Hence it is that many of the conscientious thinkers in the present day are so inclined to despair for the future of society. They see what the old principles on which society has been governed must finally become powerless. What they do not see is that a new basis for morality is being gradually laid down. Their theories are too imperfect and incoherent to show them that the direction towards which the present time is ultimately tending. It must be owned, too, that their view seems borne out by the present character of the positive method. While all allow its utility in the treatment of practical and even speculative problems, it seems to most men, and very naturally, quite unfit to deal with questions of morality. In human nature, and therefore the positive system, affection is the preponderating element. But on closer examination they will see reason to rectify their judgment. They will see that the hardiness with which positive science has been justly reproached is due to the speciality and want of purpose with which it has hitherto been pursued, and is not at all inherent in its nature. Originating as it did in the necessities of our material nature, which for a long time restricted it to the study of the inorganic world, it has not till now become sufficiently complete or systematic to harmonize well with our moral nature. But now that it is brought to bear upon social questions, which for the future will form its most important field, it loses all the defects peculiar to its long period of infancy. The very attribute of reality, which is claimed by the new philosophy, leads it to treat all subjects from the moral still more than from the intellectual side. The necessity of assigning with exact truth the place occupied by the intellect and by the heart in the organization of human nature and of society leads to the decision that affection must be the central point in the synthesis. In the treatment of social questions, positive science will be found utterly to discard the proud illusions of the supremacy of reason to which it has been liable during its preliminary stages. Ratifying in this respect the most common experience of men even more forcibly than Catholicism, it teaches us that individual happiness and public welfare are far more dependent upon the heart than upon the intellect. But independently of this question, of coordinating the facilities of our nature, will convince us that the only basis on which they can be brought into harmonious union is the preponderance of affection over reason, and even over activity. The fact that intellect as well as social sympathy is a distinctive attribute of our nature might lead us to suppose that either of those two might be supreme, and therefore that there might be more than one method of establishing unity. The fact, however, is that there is only one, because the 
two elements are by no means equal in their fitness for assuming in the first place. Whether we look at the distinctive qualities of each, or at the degree of force which they possess, it is easy to see that the only position for which the intellect is permanently adapted is to be the servant of the social sympathies. If instead of being content with its honourable post, it aspires to become supreme, its ambitious aims, which are never realised, result simply in the most deplorable disorder. Even with the individual, it is impossible to establish permanent harmony between our various impulses, except by giving complete supremacy to the feeling which prompts the sincere and habitual desire of doing good. This feeling is, no doubt, like the rest, in itself blind. It has to learn from reason the right means of obtaining satisfaction, and our active faculties are then called into requisition to apply those means. But common experience proves that after all the principal conditions of right action is the benevolent impulse, with the ordinary amount of intellect and activity that is found in men this stimulus, if well sustained, is enough to direct our thoughts and energies to a good result. Without this habitual spring of action, they would inevitably waste themselves in barren or incoherent efforts and speedily relapse into their original torpor. Unity in our moral nature, then, is impossible, except in so far as affection preponderates over intellect and activity. The proper function of intellect is the service of the social sympathies. True as this fundamental principle is for the individual, it is in public life that it is a necessity and can be demonstrated most irrefutably. The problem is in reality the same, nor is any different solution of it required. Only it assumes such increased dimensions that less uncertainty is felt as to the method to be adopted. The various beings whom it is sought to harmonise have in this case each a separate existence. It is clear, therefore, that the first condition of cooperation must be sought in their own inherent tendency to universal love. No calculations of self-interest can rival this social instinct, whether in promptitude and breadth of intuition, or in boldness and tenacity of purpose. True, it is the benevolent emotions have them in the most cases the less intrinsic energy than the selfish, but they have this beautiful quality, that social life not only commits their growth, but stimulates it to an almost unlimited extent, while it holds their antagonists in constant check. Indeed, the increasing tendency in the former to prevail over the latter is the best measure by which to judge of the progress of humanity. But the intellect may do much to confirm their influence. It may strengthen their social feeling by diffusing juster views of the relation in which the various parts of society stand to each other, or it may guide its application by dwelling on the lessons which the past offers to the future. It is to this honourable service that the new philosophy would direct our intellectual powers. Here the highest sanction is given to their operations, and an exhaustless field is opened out for them, from which far deeper satisfaction may be gained than from the approbation of the learned societies, or from the puerile specialties in which they are present occupied. In fact, the ambitious claim which, ever since the hopeless decline of the theological synthesis, have been advanced by the intellect, never were or could be realised. Their only value lay in the solvent action on the theological system when it had become hostile to progress. The intellect is intended for service, not for empire. When it imagines itself supreme, it is really only obeying the personal instead of the social instincts. It never acts independently of feeling, be that feeling good or bad. The first condition of command is force, now reason has but light. The impulse that moves must come from elsewhere. The metaphysical utopias, in which life of pure contemplation is held out as the highest ideal, attract the notice of our men of science, but are really nothing but illusions of pride, or veils for dishonest schemes. True, there is a genuine satisfaction in the act of discovering truth, but it is not sufficiently intense to be a habitual guide of conduct. Indeed, so feeble is our intellect, that the impulse of some passion is necessary to direct and sustain it almost every effort. When the impulse comes from kindly feeling, it attracts attention on account of its rarity or value. When it springs from the selfish motives of glory, ambition or gain, it is too common to be remarked. This is usually the only difference between the two cases. It does indeed occasionally happen that the intellect is actuated by a sort of passion for truth in itself, without any mixture of pride or vanity. 
Yet, in this case, as in every other, there is intense egotism in exercising the mental powers irrespectively of all social objects. Positivism, as I shall afterwards explain, is even more severe than Catholicism in its condemnation of this type of character, whether in metaphysicians or in men of science. The true philosopher would consider it a most culpable abuse of the opportunities which civilization affords him for the sake of the welfare of society in leading a speculative life. We have traced the positive principle from its origins in the pursuit of active life and have seen it extending successively to every department of speculation. We now find it in its maturity and that as a simple result of its strict adherence to fact embracing the sphere of affection and making that sphere the central point of its synthesis. It is henceforth a fundamental doctrine of positivism, a doctrine of as great political as philosophical importance that the heart preponderates over the intellect. Under theology the intellect was the slave of the heart, under positivism its servant. It is true that the doctrine which is the only basis for establishing harmony in our nature has been, as I have before remarked, instinctively accepted by the theological systems. But it was one of the fatalities of our society in its preliminary phase that the doctrine was coupled with an error which, after time, destroyed all its value. In acknowledging the superiority of the heart, the intellect was reduced to abject submission. Its only chance of growth lay in the resistance to the established system. This course it followed with increasing effect, till after twenty centuries of insurrection the system collapsed. The natural result of the process was to stimulate metaphysical and scientific pride and to promote views subversive of all social order. But positivism, while systematically adopting the principle here spoken of as the foundation of individual and social discipline, interprets that principle in a different way. It teaches that, while it is for the heart to suggest our problems, it is for the intellect to solve them. Now the intellect was at first quite inadequate to this task, for which a long and laborious training was needed. The heart, therefore, had to take its place, and in default of objective truth, to give free play to its subjective inspirations. But for these inspirations, all progress, as I showed in my System of Positive Philosophy, would have been totally impossible. For a long time it was necessary that they should be believed absolutely, but as soon as our reason began to mould its conceptions upon observations, more or less accurate, of the external world, these supernatural dogmas became inevitably an obstacle to its growth. Here lies the chief source of the important modifications which the theological belief has successively undergone. No further modifications are now possible without violating its essential principles, and since, meantime, positive science is assuming every day larger proportions, the conflict between them is advancing with increasing vehemence and danger. The tendency on the one side is becoming more retrograde, on the other more revolutionary, because the impossibility of reconciling the two opposing forces is felt more and more strongly. Never was this position of affairs more manifest than now. The restoration of theology to its original power, supposing such a thing were possible, would have the most degrading influence on the intellect and, consequently, on the character also, since it would involve the admission that our views of scientific truth were to be strained into accordance with our wishes and our wants. Therefore no important step in the progress of humanity can now be made without totally abandoning the theological principle. The only service of any real value which it still renders is that of forcing the attention of Western Europe, by the very fact of its reactionary tendencies, upon the greatest of all social questions. It is owing to its influence that the central point of the new synthesis is placed in our moral rather than in our intellectual nature, and this in spite of every prejudice and habit of thought that has been formed during the revolutionary period of the last five centuries. And while in this, which is the primary condition of social organization, positivism proves more efficient than theology, it is at the same time the termination of the disunion which has existed so long between the intellect and the heart. 
for it follows logically from its principles and also from the whole spirit of the system that the intellect shall be free to exercise its full share of influence in every department of human life when it is said that the intellect should be subordinate to the heart what is meant is that the intellect should devote itself exclusively to the problems which the heart suggests the ultimate object being to find proper satisfaction for our various wants without this limitation experience has shown too clearly that it would almost always follow its natural bent for useless or insoluble questions which are the most plentiful and the easiest to deal with but when any problem of a legitimate kind has been once proposed it is the sole judge of the method to be pursued and of the utility of the results obtained its province is to inquire into the present in order to foresee the future and to discover the means of improving it in this province it is not to be interfered with in a word the intellect is to be the servant of the heart not its slave under these two correlative conditions the elements of our nature will at last be brought into harmony the equilibrium of the two elements once established is in little danger of being disturbed for since it is equally favourable to both of them both will be interested in maintaining it the fact that reason in modern times has become habituated to revolt is no ground for supposing that it will always retain its revolutionary character even when its legitimate claims have been fully satisfied supposing the case to arise however society as i shall show afterwards would not be without the means of repressing any pretensions that were subversive of order there is another point of view which may assure us that the position given to the heart under the new system will involve no danger to the growth of intellect love when real ever desires light in order to attain its end the influence of true feeling is as favorable to sound thought as to wise activity the subordination of the intellect to the heart is the subjective principle of positivism our doctrine therefore is one which renders hypocrisy and oppression alike impossible and it now stands forward as the result of all the efforts of the past for the regeneration of order which whether considered individually or socially is so deeply compromised by the anarchy of our present time it establishes a fundamental principle by which true philosophy and sound polity are brought into correlation a principle which can be felt as well as proved and which is at once the keystone of a system and the basis of government i shall show moreover in the fifth chapter that the doctrine is as rich in its aesthetic beauty as in philosophical power and in social influence this will complete the proof of its efficacy as the centre of a universal system viewed from the moral scientific or poetical aspect it is equally valuable and it is the only principle which can bring humanity safely through the most formidable crisis that she has ever yet undergone it will now be clear that the force of demonstration a force peculiar to modern times and which still retains much of its destructive character becomes matured and elevated by positivism it begins to develop constructive tendencies which will soon de be developed more largely it is not too much then to say that positivism notwithstanding its speculative origin offers as much to natures of deep sympathy as to men of highly cultivated intellects or of energetic character objective basis of the system external order of the world as revealed by science the spirit and principle of the synthesis which all true philosophers should endeavour to establish have now been defined i proceed to explain the method that should be followed in the task and the peculiar difficulty with which it is attended the object of the synthesis will not be secured until it embraces the whole extent of its domain the moral and practical departments as well as the intellectual but these three departments cannot be dealt with simultaneously they follow an order of succession which so far from dissevering them from the whole to which they belong is seen when carefully examined to be a natural result of their mutual dependence the truth is and it is a truth of great importance that thoughts must be systematized before feelings feelings before actions 
It is doubtless owing to a confused apprehension of this truth that philosophers hitherto, in framing their systems of human nature, have dealt almost exclusively with our intellectual faculties. The necessity of communicating with the coordination of ideas is not merely due to the fact that the relations of these, being more simple and more susceptible of demonstration, form a useful logical preparation for the remainder of the task. On closer examination, we find it a more important, though less obvious, reason. If this first portion of the work be once efficiently performed, it is the foundation of all the rest. In what remains, there is no very serious difficulty which will occur, provided always that we content ourselves with that degree of completeness which the ultimate purpose of the system requires. End of section one, recording by Morris in Halsey, Bedfordshire. Section number two of A General View of Positivism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A General View of Positivism by Auguste Comte, translated by John Henry Bridger. Chapter one, The Intellectual Character of Positivism, part two. To give such paramount importance to this portion of the subject may seem at first slightly inconsistent with the proposition just laid down that the strength of the intellectual faculties is far inferior to that of the other elements of our nature it is quite certain that feeling and activity have much more to do with any practical step that we may make than pure reason in attempting to explain this paradox we come at last to the peculiar difficulty of this great problem of human unity the first condition of unity is a subjective principle and this principle in the positive system is the subordination of the intellect to the heart. Without this, the unity that we seek can never be placed on a permanent basis, whether individually or collectively. It is essential to have some influence sufficiently powerful to produce convergence amid the heterogeneous and often antagonistic tendencies of so complex an organism as ours. But this first condition, indispensable as it is, would be quite insufficient for the purpose without some objective basis existing independently of ourselves in the external world. That basis consists for us in the laws of order of the phenomenon by which humanity is regulated. The subjection of human life to this order is incontestable, and as soon as the intellect has enabled us to comprehend it, it becomes possible for the feeling of love to exercise a controlling influence over our discordant tendencies. This then is the mission allotted to the intellect in the positive synthesis. In this sense it is that it should be consecrated to the service of the heart. I have said that this conception of human unity must be totally inadequate and indeed cannot deserve the name so long as it does not embrace every element of our nature. But it would be equally fatal for the completeness of this great conception to think of human nature irrespectively of what lies outside it. A purely subjective unity without any objective basis would be simply impossible. In the first place any attempt to coordinate man's moral nature without regard to the external world, supposing the attempt feasible, would have very little permanent influence on our happiness, whether collectively or individually since happiness depends so largely upon our relations to all that exists around us. Besides this, we have to consider the exceeding imperfections of our nature. Self-love is deeply implanted in it, and when left to itself is far stronger than social sympathy. The social instincts would never gain the mastery were they not sustained and called into constant exercise by the economy of the external world, an influence which at the same time checks the power of the selfish instincts. By the selfish affections are controlled, the unselfish strengthened. To understand this economy aright, we must remember that it embraces not merely the inorganic world, but also the phenomena of our own existence. The phenomena of all human life, though more modifiable than any others, are yet equally subject to the invariable laws, laws which form the principal objects of positive speculation. Now the benevolent affections, which themselves act in harmony with the laws of social development, incline us to submit to all other laws as soon as the intellect has discovered their existence. 
The possibility of moral unity depends, therefore, even in the case of the individual, but still more in that of society, upon the necessity of recognizing our subjection to an external power. By this means our self-regarding instincts are rendered susceptible of discipline. In themselves they are strong enough to neutralize all sympathetic tendencies, were it not for the support that the latter find in the external order. Its discovery is due to the intellect which thus enlists it in the service of feeling, and with the ultimate purpose of regulating action. Thus it is that an intellectual synthesis or systematic study of the laws of nature is needed on a far higher ground than those of satisfying our theoretical faculties, which are for the most part very feeble even in men who devote themselves to a life of thought. It is needed because it solves at once the most difficult problem of our moral synthesis. The higher impulses within us are brought under the influence of a powerful stimulus from without. By its means they are enabled to control our discordant impulses and to maintain a state of harmony towards which they have always tended, but which, without such aid, could never be realized. Moreover, this conception of the order of nature evidently supplies the basis for a synthesis of human action, for the efficacy of our action depends entirely on their conformity to this order. But this part of the subject has been fully explained in my previous work, and I need not enlarge upon it further. As soon as the synthesis of mental conceptions enables us to form a synthesis of feelings, it is clear that there will be no very serious difficulties in constructing a synthesis of actions. Unity of action depends upon unity of impulse and unity of design, and thus we find that the coordination of human nature as a whole depends ultimately on the coordination of mental conceptions, a subject which seemed at first of comparatively slight importance. The subjective principle of positivism, that is, the subordination of the intellect to the heart, is thus fortified by an objective basis, the immutable necessity of the external world, and by this means it becomes possible to bring human life within the influence of social sympathy. The superiority of the new synthesis to the old is even more evident under this second aspect than it was under the first. In theological systems, the objective basis was supplied by spontaneous belief in a supernatural will. Now, whatever the degree of reality attributed to these fictions, they all proceeded from a subjective source, and therefore their influence in most cases must have been very confused and fluctuating. In respect of moral discipline, they cannot be compared either for precision or for force or stability to the conception of invariable order actually existing without us and attested, whether we will or no, by every act of our existence. Our conception of the external order has been gradually growing from the earliest times, and it is but just complete. The fundamental doctrine of positivism is not to be attributed in the full breadth of its meanings to any single thinker. It is the slow result of a vast process carried out in separate departments, which began with the first use of our intellectual powers, and which is only just completed in those who exhibit those powers in their highest form. During the long period of her infancy, humanity has been preparing this most precious of her intellectual attainments as the basis for the only system of life which is permanently adapted to our nature. The doctrine has to be demonstrated in all the more essential cases from observation only, except so far as we admit argument from analogy. Deductive argument is not admissible, except in such cases are evidently compounded of others which the proof has been given as sufficient. Thus, for instance, we are not authorised by sound logic to assert the existence of laws of weather, though most of these are still, and perhaps always will be, unknown. For it is clear that the meteorological phenomena result from a combination of astronomical, physical and chemical influences, each of which has been proved to be subject to invariable laws. But in all phenomena, which are not thus reducible, we must have course to inductive reasoning, for a principle which is the basis of all deduction cannot itself be deduced. Hence it is that the doctrine, being so entirely foreign as it is to our primitive mental state, requires such a long course of preparation. Without such preparation, even the greatest thinkers could not anticipate it. It is true that in some cases metaphysical conceptions of a law 
had been formed before the proof really required had been furnished. But they were never of much service except in so far as they generalised in a more or less confused way the analogies naturally suggested by the laws which had actually been discovered in simpler phenomena. Besides, such assertions always remained very doubtful and very barren in result until they were based upon some outline of a really positive theory. Thus, in spite of the apparent potency of this metaphysical method, to which modern intellects are so addicted, the conception of an external order is still extremely imperfect in many of the most cultivated minds, because they have not verified it sufficiently in the most intricate and important class of phenomena, the phenomena of society. I am not, of course, speaking of the few thinkers who accept my discovery of the principal laws of sociology. Such uncertainty in a subject so closely related to all others produce, produces a great confusion in men's minds and affects their perception of an invariable order, even in the simplest subjects. A proof of this is the utter delusion to which most geometricians of the present day have fallen with respect to what they call the calculus of chances, a conception which presupposes that the phenomena considered are not subject to law. The doctrine, therefore, cannot be considered as firmly established in any one case until it has been verified specially in every one of the primary categories in which the phenomena may be classed. But now that this difficult condition has really been fulfilled by the few thinkers who have risen to the level of their age, we will have at last a firm objective basis on which to establish the harmony of our moral nature. That basis is that all events whatever, the events of our own personal and social life included, are always subject to the natural relations of sequence and similitude which in all essential respects lie beyond the reach of our interference. Even when not modifiable, its influence on the character is of the greatest value. This then is the external basis of our synthesis, which includes the moral and practical faculties as well as their speculative. It rests at every point on the unchangeable order of the world. The right understanding of this order is the principal subject of our thoughts. Its preponderating influence determines the general course of our feelings. Its gradual improvement is the constant object of our actions. To form a more precise notion of its influence, let us imagine for a moment that it really were to cease. The result would be that our intellectual faculties, after wasting themselves in wild extravagancies, would sink rapidly into incurable sloth. Our nobler feelings would be unable to prevent the ascendancy of the lower instincts and our active powers would abandon themselves to purposeless agitation. Men have, it is true, been for a long time ignorant of this order. Nevertheless, we have always been subject to it and its influence has always tended, though without our knowledge, to control our whole being our actions first and subsequently our thoughts and even our affections. As we have advanced in our knowledge of it, our thoughts have become less vague, our desires less capricious, our conduct less arbitrary. And now that we are able to grasp the full meaning of the conception, its influence extends to every part of our conduct. For it teaches us that the object to be aimed at in the economy devised by man is wise development of the irresistible economy of nature, which cannot be amended till it is first studied and obeyed. In some departments it has the character of fate, that is, it admits of no modification, but even here, in spite of the superficial objections to which have arisen from intellectual pride, it is necessary for the proper regulation of human life. Suppose, for instance, that man were exempt from the necessity of living on the earth and were free to pass at will from one planet to another. The very notion of society would be rendered impossible by the license which each individual would have to give away to whatever unsettling and distracting impulses his nature might incline him. Our propensities are so heterogeneous and so deficient in elevation that they would keep no fixity or consistency in our conduct but for these insurmountable conditions. Our feeble reason may fret at such restrictions but without them all its deliberations would be confused and purposeless. We are powerless to create. All that we do in bettering our condition is to modify an order which we can produce no radical change. Supposing us in possession of that absolute independence to which metaphysical pride aspires, it is certain that so far from improving our condition, it would be a bar to all development, whether social or individual. 
The true path of human progress lies in the opposite direction, in diminishing the vacillation, inconsistency and discordance of our designs by furnishing external motives for those operations of our intellectual, moral and practical powers, of which the original source was purely internal. The ties by which our various diverging tendencies are held together would be quite inadequate for their purpose, without a basis of support in the external world which is unaffected by the spontaneous variations of our nature. But however great the value of positive doctrine in pointing out the unchangeable aspects of the universal order, what we have principally to consider are the numerous departments in which that order admits of artificial modifications. Here lies the most important sphere of human activity. The only phenomena indeed which we are wholly unable to modify are the simplest of all, the phenomena of the solar system which we inhabit. It is true that now we know its laws we can easily conceive them improved in certain respects, but to whatever degree our power over nature may extend we shall never be able to produce the slightest change in them. What we have to do is so to dispose our lives as to submit to these resistless fatalities in the best way we can. And this is comparatively easy because their greater simplicity enables us to foresee them with more precision and in a more distinct future. Their interpretation by positive science has had a most important influence on the gradual education of the human intellect and it will always continue to be the source from which we obtain the clearest and most impressive sense of immutability. Too exclusively studied, they might even now lead to fatalism, but controlled as their influence will be henceforward by a more philosophic education, they may well become a means of moral improvement by disposing us to submit with resignation to all evils which are absolutely insurmountable. But in most cases we can modify it, and in these the knowledge of it forms the systematic basis of human actions. In other parts of the external economy, invariability in all primary aspects is found compatible with modifications in points of secondary importance. These modifications become more numerous and extensive as the phenomena are more complex. The reason of this is that the causes form combination of which the effects proceed more varied and are more accessible. They offer greater facilities to our feeble powers to interfere with advantage. But all this has been fully explained in my system of positive philosophy. The tendency of that work was to show that our intervention became more efficacious in proportion as the phenomena upon which we acted has a, had a closer relation to the life of man or society. Indeed, extensive modifications of which society admits go far to keep up the common mistake that social phenomena are not subject to any constant law. At the same time, we have to remember that this increased possibility of human intervention in certain parts of the external order necessarily coexists with an increased imperfection for which there is a valuable but very inadequate compensation. Both features alike result from the increase in complexity. Even the laws of the solar system are very far from perfect, notwithstanding their greater simplicity, which indeed makes their defects more perceptible. The existence of these defects should be taken into careful consideration, not indeed with the hope of amending them, but as a check upon unreasoning admiration. Besides, they lead us to clearer conception of the true position of humanity, a position of which is the most striking feature is the necessity of struggling against difficulties of every kind. Lastly, by observing these deficits, we are likely to waste our time in seeking for absolute perfection and so neglecting the wiser course of looking for such improvements that are really possible. In all other phenomena, the increasing imperfection of the economy of nature becomes a powerful stimulus to all our faculties, whether moral, intellectual or practical. Here we find sufferings which can really be alleviated to a large extent by wise and well-sustained combination of efforts. This consideration should give a firmness and dignity of bearing to which humanity could never attain during her period of infancy. Those who look wisely into the future of society will feel that the conception of man becoming without fear or boast the arbiter within certain limits of his own destiny has in it something far more satisfying than the old belief in providence which implied our remaining passive. 
social union will be strengthened by the conception because everyone will see that union forms our principal resource against the miseries of human life and while it calls out our noblest sympathies it impresses us more strongly with the importance of high intellectual culture being itself the object for which such culture is required these important results have ever been on the increase in modern times yet hitherto they have been too limited and causal to be appreciated rightly except in so far as we could anticipate the future of society by the light of sound historical principles art so far as it is yet organized does not include that part of the economy of nature which being the most modifiable the most imperfect and the most important of all ought on every ground to be regarded as the principal object of human exertions even medical art specially so called as it is only just beginning to free itself from its primitive routine and social art whether moral or political is plunged in routine so deeply that few statesmen admit the possibility of shaking it off yet of all the arts it is the one which best admits of being reduced to a system and until this is done it will be impossible to place on a rational basis all the rest of our practical life all these narrow views are due simply to insufficient recognition of the fact that the highest phenomena are as much subject to laws as others when the conception of the order of nature has become generally accepted in its full extent the ordinary definition of art will become as comprehensive and as homogeneous as that of science and it will then become obvious to all sound thinkers that the principal sphere of both art and science is the social life of man thus the social services of the intellect are not limited to revealing the existence of an external economy and the necessity of submission in its sway if the theory is to have any influence on our active powers it should include an exact estimate of the imperfections of this economy and of the limits within which it varies so as to indicate and define the boundaries of human intervention thus it will always be an important function of philosophy to criticize nature in a positive spirit although the antipathy to theology by which such criticism was formerly animated has ceased to have much interest from the very fact of having it having done its work so effectually the object of positive criticism is not controversial it aims simply at putting the great question of human life in a clearer light it bears closely on what positivism teaches to be the great end of life namely the struggle to become more perfect which implies previous imperfection this truth is strikingly apparent when applied to the case of our own nature for true morality requires a deep and habitual consciousness of our natural defects end of section two recording by morris in arsey bedfordshire Section number three of A General View of Positivism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A General View of Positivism by Auguste Con, translated by John Henry Bridges. Chapter one, The Intellectual Character of Positivism, part three. The chief difficulty of the positive synthesis was to complete our conception of the external order by extending it to social phenomena. I have now described the fundamental condition of the positive synthesis, deriving its subjective principle from the affections. It is dependent ultimately on the intellect for its objective basis. This basis connects it with the economy of the external world, the dominion of which humanity accepts, and at the same time modifies. I have left many points unexplained, but enough has been said for the purposes of this work, which is only the introduction of a larger treatise. We now come to the essential difficulty that presented itself in the construction of the synthesis. That difficulty was to discover the true theory of human and social development. The first decisive step in its discovery renders the conception of the order of nature complete. It stands out then as the fundamental doctrine of a universal system, for which the whole course of modern progress has been preparing the way. For three centuries men of science have been unconsciously cooperating in the work. 
they have left no gap of any importance except in the region of moral and social phenomena. And now that man's history has been for the first time systematically considered as a whole, and has been found to be, like all other phenomena, subject to invariable laws, the preparatory labours of modern science are ended. Her remaining task is to construct, construct that synthesis which will place her at the only point of view which every department of knowledge can be embraced. In my system of positive philosophy, both these objects were aimed at. I attempted, and in the opinion of principal thinkers of our time successfully, to complete and at the same time coordinate natural philosophy by establishing the general law of human development, social as well as intellectual. I shall not now enter into the discussion of this law, since its truth is no longer contested. Fuller consideration of it is reserved for the third volume of my new treaties. It lays down, as is generally known, that our speculations upon all subjects whatsoever pass necessarily through three successive stages. A theological stage, in which free play is given to spontaneous fictions of admitting of no proof. The metaphysical stage, characterised by the prevalence of personified abstractions or entities. And lastly, the positive stage, based on an exact view of the real facts of the case. The first, though purely provisional, is invariably the point from which we start. The third is the only permanent or normal state. The second has but modifying, or rather a solvent influence, which qualifies it for regulating the transition from the first stage to the third. We begin with theological imagination, thence we pass through metaphysical discussion, thence we at last end with positive demonstration. Thus, by means of this one general law, we are enabled to take a comprehensive and simultaneous view of the past, the present, and the future of humanity. In my system of positive philosophy, this law of filiation has always been associated with the law of classification, the application of which to social dynamics furnishes the second element requisite for the theory of development. It fixes the order in which our different conceptions pass through each of these phases. That order as is generally known, is determined by the decreasing generality, or what comes to the same thing, by the increasing complexity of the phenomena, the more complex being naturally dependent on those that are more simple and less special. Arranging the sciences according to this mutual relation, we find them grouped naturally in six primary divisions. Mathematics, astronomy, physics, chemistry, biology and sociology. Each passes through the three phases of development before the one succeeding it. Without continuous reference to this classification, the theory of development would be confused and vague. The theory thus derived from the combination of this second or st statical law with the dynamical law of the three stages seems at first sight to include nothing but the intellectual movement. But my previous remarks will have shown that it is enough to guarantee the applicability to social progress also, since social progress has invariably depended on the growth of our fundamental beliefs with regard to the economy that surrounds us. The historical portion of my positive philosophy has proved an unbroken connection between the development of activity and that of speculation, on the combined influence of these depends on the development of affection. The theory therefore requires no alteration. What is wanted is merely an additional statement explaining the phases of active, that is to say, of political development. Human activity, as I have long since shown, passes successively through the stages of offensive warfare, defensive warfare and industry. The respective connection of these stages, with a preponderance of the theological, then, then metaphysical, or the positive spirit, leads at once to a complete explanation of history. It reproduces in a systematic form the only historical conception which has become adopted by universal consent, the division, namely, of history into ancient, medieval and modern. Thus the foundation of social science depends simply upon establishing the truth of this theory of development. We do this by combining the dynamic law, which is dis its distinctive feature, with the statical principle which renders it coherent then we complete the theory by extending it to practical life. All knowledge is now brought within the sphere of natural philosophy, and the provisional distinction by which, since Aristotle and Plato, it has been so sharply demarcated from moral philosophy ceases to exist. The positive spirit, 
so long confined to the simpler or inorganic phenomena, has now passed through its difficult course of probation. It extends to a more important and a more intricate class of speculations and disengages them for ever from all theological or metaphysical influence. All our notions of truth are thus rendered hom homogeneous and begin at once to converge towards a central principle. A firm objective basis is consequently laid down for that complete coordination of human existence towards which all sound philosophy has ever tended, but which the want of adequate materials has hitherto made impossible. By the discovery of sociological laws, social questions are made paramount, and thus our subjective principle is satisfied without danger to three free thought. It will be felt, I think, that the principal difficulty of the positive synthesis was met by my discovery of the laws of development. If we bear in mind that while the theory completes and coordinates the objective basis of the system, it, at the same time, holds it in subordination to the subjective principle. It is under the influence of this moral principle that the whole philosophical construction should be carried on. The inquiry into the order of the universe is an indispensable task, and it comes necessarily within the province of the intellect, but the intellect is too apt to aim in its pride at something beyond its proper function, which consists in unremitting service of the social sympathies. It would winningly escape from all control and follow its own bent towards speculative di digressions, a tendency which is favoured at present by the undisciplined habits of thought naturally due to the first rise of positivism in its special departments. The influence of the moral principle is necessary to recall it to its true function, since of its investigation were allowed to assume an absolute character and to recognise no limit, we should only be repeating in a scientific form many of the worst results of theological and metaphysical belief. The universe is to be studied not for its own sake, but for the sake of man, or rather of humanity. To study it in any other spirit would not only be immoral, but also highly irrational. For, as statements of pure objective truth, our scientific theories can never really be satisfactory. They only satisfy us from the subjective point of view, that is, by limiting themselves to the treatment of such questions as have some direct or indirect influence over human life. It is for social feeling to determine these limits, outside which our knowledge will always remain imperfect as well as useless. And this even in the case of the simplest phenomena, as astronomy testifies. Were the influence of social feelings to be slackened, the positive spirit would soon fall back to the subjects which were preferred during the period of its infancy, subjects the most remote from human interest and therefore the easiest. While its probationary period lasted, it was natural to investigate all accessible problems without distinction, and this was often justified by the logical value of many problems that, scientifically speaking, were useless. But now that the positive method has been sufficiently developed to be applied exclusively to the purpose for which it was intended, there is no use whatsoever in prolonging the period of probation by these idle exercises. Indeed, the want of purpose and discipline in our researches is rapidly assuming a retrograde character. Its tendency is to undo the chief results obtained by the spirit of detail during the time when that spirit was really essential to progress. Here, then, we are met by a serious difficulty. The construction of the objective basis for the positive synthesis imposes two conditions which seem, at first sight, incompatible. On the one hand, we must allow the intellect to be free, or else we shall not have the full benefit of its services, and on the other, we must control its natural tendency to unlimited digressions. The problem was insoluble so long as the study of the natural economy did not include sociology. But as soon as the positive spirit extends to the treatment of social questions, these at once take precedence of all others, and thus the moral point of view becomes paramount. Objective science, proceeding from without inwards, falls at last into natural harmony with the subjective or moral principle, the superiority of which it had for so long time resisted. As a mere speculative question, it might be considered as proved to the satisfaction of every true thinker that the social point of view is logically and scientifically supreme over all others, being the only point from which our scientific conceptions can be regarded as a whole. Yet its influence can never be injurious to the process of other positive studies, for these, whether for the sake of their method or their subject matter, 
will always continue to be necessary as an introduction to the final science. Indeed, the positive system gives the highest sanction and the most powerful stimulus to all preliminary sciences by insisting on the relation to which each of them bears to the great whole, humanity. Thus, the foundation of social science bears out the statement made at the beginning of this work, that the intellectual would, under positivism, accept its proper position of subordination to the heart. The recognition of this, which is the subjective principle of positivism, renders the construction of a complete system of human life impossible. The antagonism which, since the close of the Middle Ages, has arisen between reason and feeling, was an anomalous though inevitable condition. It is now forever at an end, and the only system which can really satisfy the wants of our nature, individually or collectively, is therefore ready for our acceptance. As long as the antagonism existed, it was hopeless to expect the social sympathy could do much to modify the preponderance of self-love in the affairs of life. But the case is different as soon as reason and sympathy are brought into active cooperation. Separately, their influence in our imperfect organisation is very feeble, but combined it may extend indefinitely. It will never indeed be able to do away with the fact that practical life must to a large extent be regulated by inter interested motives, yet it may introduce a standard of morality inconceivably higher than any that has existed in the past, before these two modifying forces could be made to combine their action upon our stronger and lower instincts. Distinction between abstract and concrete laws. It is the former only that we require for the purpose before us. In order to give more precise conception of the intellectual basis on which the system of positive polity should rest, I must explain the general principle by which it should be limited. It should be confined to what is really indispensable to the constitution of that policy, otherwise the intellect will be carried away, as it has been before by its tendency to useless digressions. It will endeavour to extend the limits of its province, thereby escaping from the discipline imposed by social motives, and putting off all attempts at moral and social regeneration for a longer time than the construction of the philosophical basis for action really demands. Here we shall find a fresh proof of the importance of my theory of development. By that discovery, the intellectual synthesis may be considered as having already reached the point from which the synthesis of affections may be at once begun, and even that of actions, at least in its highest and most difficult part, morality properly so called. With the view of restricting the construction of the objective basis within reasonable limits, there is this distinction to be borne in mind. In the order of nature, there are two classes of laws, those that are simple or abstract, those that are compound or concrete. In my work on positive philosophy, this distinction has been thoroughly established, and frequent use has been made of it. It will be sufficient here to point out its origin and the method of applying it. Of course, we can only judge of an object by the sum of its phenomena, but it is open to us either to examine a special class of phenomena abstracted from all the beings that exhibit it, or to take some special object and examine a whole concrete group of phenomena. In the latter case we shall be studying different systems of existence, in the former different modes of activity. As good an example of the distinction as can be given is that, already mentioned, of meteorology. The facts of weather are evidently combinations of astronomical, physical, chemical, biological and even social phenomena, each of these classes requiring its own separate theories. Were these abstract laws sufficiently well known to us, then the whole difficulty of the concrete problem would be how to combine them, as to deduce the order in which each composite effect would follow. This, however, is a process which seems to me far beyond our feeble powers of deduction, that even supposing our knowledge of the abstract laws perfect, we should still be obliged to have recourse to the inductive method. Now the investigation of the economy of nature here contemplated is evidently of the abstract kind. We decompose that economy into its primary phenomena, that is to say, into those which are not reducible to others. These we range in classes, each of which, notwithstanding the connection that exists between all, requires a separate inductive process, for the existence of laws cannot be proved in any one of them by pure deduction. It is only with these simpler and more abstract relations that our synthesis is directly concerned. When these are established, they afford rational groundwork for the more composite and concrete researches. The great complexity of concrete relations 
make it probable that we shall never be able to coordinate them perfectly. In that case the synthesis would always remain limited to abstract laws. But its true object, that of supplying an objective basis for the great synthesis of human life, will nonetheless be attained. For this groundwork of abstract knowledge would introduce harmony between all our mental conceptions and thereby would make it impossible to systematize our feelings and actions, which is the object of all sound philosophy. The abstract study of nature is therefore all that is absolutely indispensable for the establishment of unity in human life. It serves as the foundation of all wise action, as the philosophia prima, the necessity of which is the normal state of humanity, was dimly foreseen by Bacon. When the abstract laws exhibiting various modes of activity have been brought systematically before us, our practical knowledge of each special system of existence ceases to be purely empirical, though the greater number of concrete laws may still be unknown. We find the best example of this truth in the most difficult and important of all, subject of all, sociology. Knowledge of the principal statical and dynamical laws of social existence is evidently sufficient for the purpose of systematizing the various aspects of private or public life, and thereby of rendering our condition far more perfect. Should this knowledge be acquired, of which there is now no doubt, we need not regret being unable to give satisfactory explanations of every state of society that we find existing through the world in all ages. The discipline of social feeling will check any foolish indulgences of the spirit of curiosity and prevent the understanding from wasting its powers in useless speculations. For feeble these powers are. It is from them that humanity derives her most efficient mean of contending against the defects of the external order. The discovery of the principal concrete laws would no doubt be attended by most beneficial results, moral as well as, as, well as physical, and this in the field which the science of the future will reap its richest harvest. But such knowledge is not indispensable for our present purpose, which is to form a complete synthesis of life, effecting for the final stage of humanity what the theological synthesis effected from its primitive state. For this purpose abstract philosophy is undoubtedly sufficient, so that even supposing concrete philosophy should never become so perfect as we desire, social regeneration will still be possible. In my theory of development, the required synthesis of abstract conceptions already exists. Regarded under this more simple aspect, our system of scientific knowledge is already so far elaborated that all thinkers whose nature is sufficiently sympathetic may proceed without delay to the problem of moral regeneration, a problem which must prepare the way for that of political reorganization. For we shall find that the theory of development of which we have been speaking, when looked at from another point of view, condenses and systematizes in all our abstract concep conceptions of the order of nature. This will be understood by regarding all departments of our knowledge as being really component parts of one and the same science, the science of humanity. All other sciences are but the prelude or development of this. Before we can either enter upon it directly, there are two subjects which it is necessary to investigate our external circumstances, and the organization of our own nature. Social life cannot be understood without first understanding the medium in which it has developed, and the beings who manifest it. We shall make no progress, therefore, in the final science until we have sufficient abstract knowledge of the outer world and of individual life to define the influence of these laws on the special laws of social phenomena. And this is necessary from the logical as well as from the scientific point of view, the feeble faculties of our intellect require us to be trained for the more difficult speculations by practice in the easier. For the same reasons, the study of the inorganic world should take precedence to the organic. For in the first place, the laws of the more universal mode of existence have a preponderating influence over those of the more special modes, and in the second place, it is clearly incumbent on us to begin the study of positive method with its simplest and most characteristic applications. I need not dwell further upon principles so fully established in my former work. Social philosophy, therefore, ought on every ground to be preceded by natural philosophy in the ordinary sense of the word, that is to say by the study of inorganic and organic nature. It is reserved for our own century to take in the whole scope of science, but the commencement of these preparatory studies dates from the first astronomical discoveries of antiquity. 
natural philosophy was completed by the modern science of biology, of which the ancient possessed nothing but a few statical principles. The dependence of biological conditions on the astronomical is very certain, but these two sciences differ too much from each other and are too indirectly connected to give us an adequate conception of the natural philosophy as a whole. It would be pushing the principle of condensation too far to reduce it to these two terms. One connecting link was supplied by the science of chemistry which arose in the Middle Ages. The natural selection of astronomy, chemistry and biology, leading gradually up to the final science sociology, made it possible to conceive more or less imperfectly of an intellectual synthesis. But the interposition of chemistry was not enough, because, though its relation to biology was intimate, it was too remote from astronomy. For want of understanding the mode which astronomical conditions really affected us, the arbitrary and chimerical fancies of astrology were employed, though of course quite valueless except for this temporary purpose. In the 17th century, however, the science of physics, specially so called, was founded, and a satisfactory arrangement of scientific conceptions began to be formed. Physics included a series of inorganic researches, the more general branch of which bordered on astronomy, the more special in chemistry. To complete our view of the scientific hierarchy, we have now only to go back to its origin. Mathematics, a class of speculation so simple and so general that they passed it at once and without effort into the positive stage. Without mathematics, astronomy was impossible, and they will always continue to be the starting point of positive education for the individual as they have been for the race. Even under the most absolute theological influence, they stimulate positive spirit to a certain degree of systematic growth. From them it extends step by step to the subjects, from which, at first, it seemed most rigidly excluded. End of section 3. Recording by Morris in Arsie, Bedfordshire.